Hello and welcome everyone and good afternoon. And for those of you on the West Coast, good morning. I want to thank you for joining us today for the Federal Aviation Administration's Recruitment Seminar Webinar for our Airway Transportation System Specialist. My name is Doug Lane. I will be your moderator today. I am the Regional HR Director for the Southwest Region for the FAA located in Fort Worth, Texas. So you will notice that your mics and cameras will be off during this presentation, which probably will last around roughly around one hour. So while your mics and cameras are off, if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, we do ask that you, you ask them. There should be a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen that you can ask any questions that you would like. And we will go on and, we, and you can ask any time during the presentation and we will answer them uh, at times that we see fit. So first off, what I'd like to do is kind of just give you an idea of how things are going to uh, roll out, the order of things. So first, we're going to have an executive give you some information regarding the technical operations department and the airway transportation system specialist uh, positions. Then we're going to play a short video, and then we have a quick presentation regarding the position and some of the things that are benefits for being a federal employee and working for the FAA. And then we're going to end with discussions with experts in this field so you get a really hands-on experience so you can understand what it's really like to be an airway transportation system specialist. So first off, I would like to introduce Jeffrey McCoy. Jeffrey McCoy is the Federal Aviation Administration's Deputy Vice President of Technical Operations services for the air traffic organization. In this role, Mr. McCoy's primary focus is the safe, efficient, and secure operation of the National Aerospace System, or DAS as we refer to it, through effective management of air navigation systems and infrastructure. Under leadership of the vice president, he directs a workforce of approximately 10,000 employees who ensures that more than 74,000 pieces of equipment and systems operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, at, at more than 6,000 locations. As the ATO cybersecurity executive, Mr. McCoy also has the primary responsibility for securing the NAS domain from emerging threats. Jeff? Thank you, Doug. Uh, and, and I just want to start by uh, thanking everyone for being here today. You know, over the past two years, because of the pandemic, we've really had to pause our hiring efforts. We are now pleased, we're now pleased to be in a position where we can once again hire, and we're excited to be here. I, I, so, so more than anything else in tech ops, and I'm sorry if you're an engineer, if you're listening to this, but ATSS recruitment is near and dear to me because I started my career as, as an ATSS. So I, when my wife and I got hired as technicians years ago, it was really a fluke that we knew that there were that FA had technicians. It was really shocking to us. But looking back, it was one of the best flukes of my career. But we've come a long way since then in our outreach and recruitment efforts. And because of the efforts of our recruitment team and your participation, we hope to take the luck out of our process. So we have a great session planned today in partnership with HR and several of our managers who can provide a lot more information about our organization, about our current recruitment efforts for these ATSS positions. Please keep in mind, this is just the start of our renewed hiring effort. So look for additional announcements to follow throughout the year. And Doug, I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. I'm gonna hand it back to you, sir. Thank you, Jeff. So right now, what we will do is play a brief video for you. Tech Ops is the glue that holds the system up. We are the foundation of the FAA. We're the ones that are down here making sure that everything is kept in control. We're the guys behind the scenes that make things happen. We're the unsung heroes. We allow our national aerospace system to be the safest in the world. I'm very proud of what I do. It's a job that actually matters, knowing that there are tens of thousands of passengers every day relying on the services that we provide. All those people on board have no idea that it's guys like me and my coworkers that are the ones keeping all that equipment on the ground, 
safe at all times. There's a big sense of accomplishment at the end of the day. Like everyone's working together, coming together and collaborating and getting the mission done. We are an all for one team. There's nothing that we can't fix when we, when we put our minds to it. It is a challenging job, no question, but it's fun. It's never boring. We're always doing something new. There's always some excitement when I come in here. All the excitement that happens throughout the day is what makes you want to come back the next day and find out what the next adventure is going to be. I can't hardly remember times when I don't want to come to work. Opportunities are endless. It all depends on what you want to do. You can be whoever you want to be. It's always kind of been a dream to to work for the FAA because of the prestige that they carried. Those FAA technicians were someone I actually looked up to and I knew right off the bat that that is what I wanted to be and who I wanted to be a part of. I have to pinch myself to realize that it's, it isn't a dream. It's, it's real life. There's no better agency to be a part of and I can't say enough good things about it. When people ask me what I do, I'm proud to say that I work for the FAA. Great, thank you. Now we will do a quick presentation and kind of get into some of the nuts and bolts of the position and up and with the FAA. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Excellent, thank you so much. So first off, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the FAA's mission. So the mission of the FAA is to pr provide the, the safest and most efficient aerospace system in the world. And I'm very proud to say that we do that every single day. As far as technical operations or tech ops, what we call them, their role in there, they are the safe keepers of the systems and equipment that keep the airspace safe. And they also are, they provide the services that support the technical backbone of the national aerospace system. And they are installing, they're operating, they're maintaining, and they're repairing more than $70,000 or 70,000 pieces of equipment with radar, communication, navigational aids, airport lighting, backup power, et cetera. The, the list goes on and on. So you can imagine the magnitude of the importance of this job where it relates to not only just the FAA, but the flying public overall. Can you imagine if, if anyone on this call has ever got on a plane safely and landed safely, you've been impacted by the FAA. And you're welcome, by the way. Uh, so what technical ops is, tech ops? They're a team of talented technicians. They are 4,000 strong. They work indoors and outdoors. They work at every location in the United States and the ter and territory. So for those of you that are looking for a job but don't feel like you can relocate anywhere, that's not a problem. We have technicians everywhere in the country. Uh, they run a 24-7 operation nonstop. They are tech ops, a very important part of the overall FAA. We couldn't, we couldn't do our job without them. So the Airway Transportation System Specialist, which is really the focus of today's session, is, is broken down into five disciplines. And so the first one is environmental and what that covers. So they maintain and repair things like lighted navigational aid system, engine generators, uh, the HVACs. And again, none of these, this list is all inclusive, but these are just a few things that we touch upon. Uh, as far as radar, you're looking at maintaining and repairing airport surveillance radar, air route surveillance radars, air traffic control beacon indicators. Under navigational aids, they maintain and repair instructional landing systems, Doppler, very high frequency omnidirectional range. That's a mouthful, but they do it. Uh, under communications, it's Motorola, ITT, or general dynamics radio, small tower voice switch, digital audio legal recorders. And under automation, it's automated radar terminal systems, direct access radar channels, en route automation modernization. Again, these are, it's not an all-inclusive list. These are just a few things, but when you think about it, it's they're responsible for installing and testing, troubleshooting and repairing everything that air traffic controllers pilots use for safe flight. 
One of the great things about being an FAA employee is there's a lot of benefits for, the, for being a government employee and specifically with the FAA. So we have health and life benefits. As soon as you come on to the agency, you're entitled to health and life benefits. And our health benefits, we have over 250 health benefits plans to choose from, which include dental and vision. And um, anyone that works out in the private sector or anyone at all that has ever had to use their benefits, their health insurance, you know how important that is. And we probably, I, we probably have the best benefit package that you can ask for. And that would include federal and private. We provide annual leave, sick leave, so your vacation time. Most in the private sector, you start out usually with two weeks of leave, sometimes three, but we start people out from, from the first time they get on board till they, for their first three years, you have about two and a half weeks of leave. We, we give it to you in hours, but you have about two and a half weeks. And from the third year to the 15 year, that goes up to four weeks and then 15 years and beyond, that's five weeks. And five weeks of leave is a lot of leave. And I know a lot of companies um, don't do that in, in just in general. And the beauty too about the uh, FAA is that you can roll over up to 30 days of leave for the following leave. If you're planning something big, if you're planning a trip or you need to be off for a certain extended period of time, you can roll leave over. And that's a unique thing for the federal government. We have very flexible work schedules and each person, depending what they're working with their manager, can get a schedule that works perfect for them with the job they're in. We have great work-life balance. I will tell you that I've worked for other federal agencies, and I will say that the FAA is by far the most progressive on work-life balance. And we really, we don't just say it, we actually do it. We have an EAP program, which is an employee assistance program. So if you need help, financial advice for help, if you need elderly care, daycare options, there's a plethora of information that we can provide and those, those services are free of, charge, free of charge for employees to get the help they need. Uh, we have upward mobility. If you're looking to start somewhere, but you think this is a great job to start at, but I may not wanna do that forever, that's not a problem. The, hard, the toughest thing about the government is actually getting into the government. Once you're in, you really can move around. I can speak for myself. Uh, this is the fifth state uh, my wife and I have lived in working for the government. We've moved around quite a bit. So whatever you're looking for, and that's the beauty of the government and specifically the FAA, whatever you're looking for, there's usually a job that's going to be very similar that we can that you can apply for. So we have a couple ways to hire people. One of them is a competitive hiring process, which anyone that has ever gone on USA Jobs and applied for a job with either the FAA or another federal agency, that's our competitive process. So you're up against a, a group of people. Every time we put a posting out, there's a bunch of people that apply for them and you get ranked to make sure you're qualified, knowledgeable, and then you're going in a competitive fashion. We also have a non-competitive route for those of you that would qualify for that. So if you are a veteran that has been recently um, ended your tour in the military or about to end your tour, you could be possibly considered for a veteran's recruitment appointment. And that's a non-competitive appointment that we could hire you outside of going through a competitive process like a post. Also, if you are a 30% or more disabled veteran, we can hire you that way too, again, non-competitively. And for those people with disabilities or what we call targeted disabilities, that's another great option for employees to be considered non-competitively. So there's a lot of ways that we can bring people on to the FAA and there's a lot of options for you as an applicant. So currently we have vacancy announcements posted right now in USA Jobs, as I said earlier. And these are all the positions that we have right now. So we went over the, the five disciplines and then we have an entry level job. So the salaries for these, and these are all more entry level type positions, but they range from $40,000 to $70,000. Now that's with these jobs early on. So of course, if you're gonna come into the government, you're gonna start in at the lower end, which by, uh, Compared to the private sector, I guess low end is not really low with us. It's around mid $40,000 range. We have jobs up to the $200,000 range in the federal government with the FAA. 
So if you start here, work your way up with that upper mobility we were talking about, there's, you know, we have many um, employees that make a six figure salary and, and very much earn it working for the FAA. So there's the website below the link. If you just went to, if you Googled USA jobs, you'll be able to get that. And you can say, put FAA or ATSS, navigational aid. There's, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but these are the jobs that we have currently available. And if you want more information with what we, besides what we just provided, here's a website that you can go to that's actually the FAA's website specifically for tech ops. And it'll give you a lot more information than what we're providing. This is just a, a brief informational webinar, of course. But there's a lot more information on there. And there's even a function in there that will ask if you have a specific question that you want to ask. So if you're looking on the page and you scroll down and you see the jobs that are listed that I did from the previous slide, it's on the left-hand side towards the bottom. There's a, a link there that says, if you want to, if you have other questions and want to contact us, click here. So we are open again, 365 days, 24 hours a day. So anytime you have a question, you can absolutely use that function and we will make sure that someone gets back to you. All right, so let me stop sharing here. And now we're going to start asking some questions. So we actually have some very impressive people on this webinar. These are experts in the field of technical operations. First off, we have Sarah Blackie from the Denver ARTCC district. She's the facility manager acting there. We have Thomas Lathrop, he's the Chicago O'Hare Communications SSC Manager, and we have Steve Smith, Miami District International SSC Manager. So I'm going to ask them a few questions. I apologize, I, my paper here. So Sarah, let's start with you first. What are the skills and experiences you're looking for in an ideal candidate? Um, thanks, Doug. Um, first of all, I'd say technical for sure. And this can be, you know, from military experience, college, trade schools, um, or other jobs, even like it could be somebody who's actually out in the real world uh, as like an HVAC technician. So they're already doing a job that is a skill set that we actually look for in the FAA. Um, of course, electronics or electrical, um, because electricians, a lot of times people think the equipment's more electronics, but we actually, on the environmental side, there's a lot of electrical work that has to be done in power panels and um, power conditioning systems. Um, when we hire people with a diverse skill set, and even if you're not specifically trained for FAA equipment, because a lot of people might have had some experience working on ILS in the military but some of the equipment doesn't transfer over because even the equipment that I worked on in Air Force, there's not a specific like type of equipment for it with the FAA, but the FAA trains you. So they send you to the academy or you do virtual training. So you get trained on the equipment. So we're hiring you for the skill set that you bring that can be used to help you become a ATSS and get certified. Experience on test equipment, that's always a big thing that comes up too, because when you go to the academy, it's very beneficial if you know how to use like a digital bolt or an OSCO, some basic test equipment. Um, not everyone's gonna know how to use a time domain reflectometer in the field. That's something you get trained on when you go to the academy, if that's part of the job that you're going to be doing. Um, we need someone who's extremely motivated, willing to learn, uh, willing to try new things. They can either work by themselves or work as a team because sometimes you do work by yourself, but there's a lot of times depending on what's going on that you need to be able to um, interact with other technicians, whether they be in your discipline or even other disciplines because you might be an ILS tech working on fiber optics, but now that's going to impact the radar equipment. So you need to work with them too. So know um, so how to troubleshoot. Reading schematics is a bonus. Use of computers and applications because so much of the things that as a technician 
does now in the field is all through the computer, whether it's logging, even virtual training using Blackboard or Elm. So wide diverse skill set, but um, yeah, we are looking for people that are wanting to learn and come join our team. Thank you, Sarah. That was extremely thorough. I appreciate that. So Steve, let's go to you next. What does a typical day in the life of an ATSS look like? Hey, I'm gonna speak from a fully trained tech technician the day in the life because as a new hire, you come in and you have a bunch of training that you need to complete to, unless you come in with a special skill, like Sarah said, like you can already work on an HVAC or have a special skill. So speak from the uh, a fully trained technician. So typically the fully trained technicians, they know what they, they plan their schedules. They, they come in prepared to work a day. Um, and they start by looking at a system called TechNet. They, they log into TechNet and look for any outages or any, any equipment problems for their assigned, assigned given workloads. They can also check their teammates to see if their teammates have any outages or anything that needs immediate attention um, because our jobs are to keep the, the planes from getting from point A to point B. After they check the, uh, the, um, the TechNet for any outages, they typically have planned scheduled events, whether that's corrective maintenance or preventive maintenance. So there's, there's logs that show every system that's in service, out of service. And there's also preventive maintenance logs for scheduling and doing um, a preventive maintenance tasks on all types of equipment, as he mentioned earlier. So they, they, they go ahead and plan their day and, and get set to, to perform those preventive or maintenance tasks. And then, and last but not least, um, they, they pretty much set their day for themselves. So they'll go ahead and, and pre-plan for events, say for the next day or, or next week or next month. They log into a system and, and, and put in tech requests and all this stuff, all these things are governed by orders uh, 6015, you'll, you'll read and you'll learn how to do those type things. But any given day, the guys come in the office, they check for outages, they look for anything that's, that's, um, that air traffic needs and they respond accordingly. So that's that's the given day of a of a ATSS. Thank you so much, Steve. All right, Tom, you're up next. What is your favorite part about working for the FAA? Thanks, Doug. Um, probably the, the the best thing for me is the fact that the, the the diversity of my technicians that I get to work with on a daily basis. I've got 10 employees ranging in age from 23 to 70 years old. I have five prior military. Three of us are retired from one job and on our second career and well into it. I've got 174 years of experience that I get to, to deal with on a daily basis. And what's nice about having such, such a diverse crowd is that I know I get to hear how we've always done it. And then I have a lot of new fresh ideas on how we could do it. And so we can have some good discussions and, and come up with better ways to do things that are more suited to today's business world and the fast paced and the, the fact that we're going more internet based and computer based on everything. So for me, it's just the opportunity to deal with, with the, the quality of people that uh, I have in my unit and at the airport at O'Hare as a whole. I, I was a technician here first. And so I, I got to know a lot of these folks as a technician and it's just, such a, a fun place to come work. It really is because it appears to me most people enjoy their jobs because we're, we're all walking around with smiles on our faces and, and getting through the day um, at O'Hare, which is like an aircraft carrier. It's either the most peaceful place on the face of the earth or it's total chaos and you never know which minute it's going to be what. But the people make this a very wonderful place to work. Thank you, Tom. And I and I actually do echo that because I've worked for other federal agencies before. And once I got to the FAA, I'm like, oh, I'm home. This I'm not going anywhere else. This is the place to work. So I, I appreciate that. That's very accurate. All right, Sarah, why did you choose the career path that you're in right now? Um, actually, it's kind of a funny story because I was actually looking to get out of the Air Force after about seven and a half years. Um, of training, working on equipment, and even teaching. I used to teach at Lowry Air Force Base here in Denver, which doesn't even exist anymore. Um, and it was, I didn't even know that the FAA had technicians. We were just called technicians back then. And we became ATSSs, but 
Um, Cause all you ever used to hear about was the air traffic controllers. Didn't have social media or anything like that to share that the FAA had jobs for technicians. Um, it was more just word of mouth. And a Navy chief that I worked with, he actually said, hey, um, have you applied with the FAA? They actually have technician jobs. And I was like, no. So as you could say, the, the rest is history. I applied, got hired, and I've been with the FAA for over 30 years now. And just as a side note on that, if you come to work for the FAA, you will find that people stay here. It's a lot of government agencies, people leave, that are not happy because of just how they get treated. If you come into a place, in fact, uh, one of the girls down the hall, she was just telling me, she goes, everybody I talked to, we've been here at least 10 years, if not 20 or 30 years. So it's a great place to work, obviously. Um, but I love my job as an ETSS. It was always something different. No two days were ever the same. You walked in and you might have a list of things you were gonna do that day and something's broken on the airfield. So off you go and go out and fix it. So it was always a challenge and always something different. You know, I'd say. Thank, okay. thank you for that, Sarah. Yes, the, the days go by very quick in the FAA and I'm sure in the tech ops uh, group organization, it's that much quicker than the rest of us because it's a very demanding job, very fulfilling. And as you can just hear what they're talking about is you can be in a job that really makes an impact in the uh, airspace. It's a big deal. Tom, let's go back to you. How has your role changed since you've been here? Hey, Doug, I, uh, after a 30 year Navy career, I came in as a uh, apprentice uh, technician in the navigation unit got qualified on the ILS uh, instrument landing systems and the uh, distance measuring equipment. We maintain 14 ILSs and seven DMEs here. After doing that for a few years, uh, the opportunity came up for me to promote up to uh, an I-band where I was a uh, program support specialist coordinating the uh, training, both commercial, local, and out at Oklahoma's, the training command uh, academy for the entire Chicago district. Um, after doing uh, some time in that role, I was uh, offered the opportunity to be the uh, communication uh, manager, frontline manager at uh, O'Hare. And hey, Doug, I see one in the uh, question queue I'd like to answer real quick while we're at it. Absolutely. I see a, I see a question from uh, Dan uh, Retina. As a telecommunication technician, where would my skills best be utilized? And I would say uh, um, in a comm unit, we have... Uh, uh, a lot of computer infrastructure. We have a lot of uh, copper infrastructure. We have 66 blocks tied to all of our FOTS equipment. And uh, two of my uh, employees have already retired from the telecommunication world and then came to work over here after working uh, 30 years at AT&T. So as a, a, a ComTech in the local three there, there's, uh, you, you should be looking at the communication world. Thank you, Tom. All right, Steve, one last question for you, sir. What gets you most excited about the FAA and tech ops for the future? Okay, um, before I answer, I gotta say, cause Sarah mentioned the Air Force and now Tom's mentioning the Navy. So I gotta mention, I was in the US Coast Guard, the best service out there. So it's a lot of veterans, but thank you. Thank you both for your service. I'm kidding around, of course. We welcome everyone. Um, what gets me excited about uh, tech ops is, is you'll find out is tech ops, we're the backbone of the ATO. Without us, these planes don't get from point A. So I'm looking, I'm very much excited about the future and what new innovations and what new technology is coming because as former techs or still techs, because I still try to work on things. My team doesn't like it, but I try. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to see what's coming down the pike, to see what I can learn and see where, where we're headed. There's a lot of technology out there and the agency is doing their best to keep up and, and even you know surpass some, some things to keep the NAS the national airspace, not supposed to be Japanese, national airspace system safe and efficient. So that's what keeps me excited there. So. Thank you, appreciate that. All right, so let's go to the Q and A's and see what we have available. So the first question are, what are the requirements for an entry level position? So before I give it to the experts on what they're looking for, I will tell you for most of our entry level positions, there, it's a three years of continuous work employment. Depending, certain jobs uh, need degrees, certain don't. 
but for general entry level positions, it's three years of progressive work. And this work can be working at a McDonald's and progressing um, up to, you know, from the working the window to a chef or to the cook, to the manager, whatever the, the three years are. Uh, you have to be, you have to be a citizen and that's pretty much it for our entry level jobs with the exception of the skills that are specific that the experts will talk to you about. And I will also say with that question that when you go to those postings that we talked about in the presentation, when you go to USA jobs, it'll tell you what the description is and what we're looking for specifically in there. And when you submit your resume, you can address it, those job duties, those job descriptions in your resume. But would anyone like to take that, Sarah, Tom, or Steve? Yeah, I can take it. Um, basic requirements, U.S. citizenship is required, selective service registration for males born after 59. There is a, uh, uh, this is a designated random drug testing position. Uh, so you will have to take, a, take and successfully pass the drug test uh, before you can uh, be hired. There is a background check that will be done um, looking for uh, financial uh, stability. Transcripts required if you're going to be basing your experience on a four-year degree. A four-year degree in math, science, uh, or engineering um, is targeted on our job positions as a uh, uh, potential F band. So if you have a four-year degree coming out of engineering school, that will qualify you as, as an F band. Um, provide proof uh, of any claims of any veteran's preference. So if you're going to go oh, VRA, which is like Doug was saying earlier, 30% disabled, compensatable disabled, or if you were uh, recently separated within the last three years, or if at, during your time you were in a campaign awarded area, i.e. if you have the um, uh, Global War on Terrorism uh, deployment, not the service medal, but the deployment medal. If you have an Afghanistan medal, an Iraq medal, a Desert Storm medal, those are all deployment medals that will qualify for VRA qualification. Um, and a valid driver's license is also required because we do an awful lot of driving around trying to dodge uh, aircraft. So you have to have a good clean driving record. And that's the basic requirements, Doug. Excellent, thank you so much. That was very helpful. All right, the next one. How would the FAA handle a, a full on-career change from warehousing? I'm not sure they're saying they don't really have technical experience. Depends on what they do in the warehouse, I guess. But I guess that would be more like an F level where you're coming in with not anything really technical experience. Um, not say, I mean, and we train everybody. So as long as they've got the aptitude, uh, they could apply for the basic F level job. Well, also an answer to that question and another question that we're going to come into on the queue about the supply and the logistics jobs. Um, there are a fair number of supply and logistics jobs with the FAA located in Kansas City and Oklahoma, and those will be on a separate job posting when they uh, become available. So you need to watch for the logistics supply uh, jobs on USA Jobs in your search window if that's your specialty. Now, if you're in a warehouse where you're doing a lot of repair and maintenance to the uh, refrigerator units in that warehouse or to the forklift, or there's a lot of other mechanical, electromechanical skill sets being utilized, um, then you, you need to really highlight those in your resume. Uh, not just, yeah, I, I work in a warehouse, but I service and maintain the forklift or the other mechanical equipment and outline that and then uh, see if, uh, you know, if it, it meets the qualification standards when you submit. Great, thank you. And we did get a question in from YouTube. Uh, this person recently had a college diploma in avionics and wants to know where to begin. Four year or two year would be my first question. So if it was a two year, where would that go? And then compared to the four year? Well, the, the F band starts at a four year degree. So unless you get three years of experience working on avionics uh, equipment and as a bench tech for one of the many companies that are out there, after you got three years bench experience working with uh, digital voltmeters and oscopes and 
signal generators and other various equipment, um, you should not have an issue getting in as an ATSS. And with a four year degree, they could be looking at uh, either the uh, ATSS positions or possibly even something over in the uh, engineering uh, uh, services unit. Excellent, thank you. The next question is, do you accept international specialists? I have undergone an internship in flights operations with an international airline. Doug, I'm not really sure what that question was asking. I saw it in the chat, I wasn't exactly sure. Yeah, that's one that we'd actually have to see what, what the job titles and duties and experience are. Um, that would that would definitely require seeing that individual or talking to them one on one um, because of the vagueness of the question. Yeah, and and to that person who wrote that question, what I what I recommend is that you go to USA Jobs and actually look at the job announcements and just see based on what you uh, the internship that you have what you've learned in there that would apply to those announcements. All right, the next question. Um, I'm very interested in recruiting based on technical aptitude rather than just focusing on actual experience. So how do you look at, um, so Sarah, Steve, or Tom, how would you go over that as far as someone with the technical aptitude with not a lot of experience? For someone like that, I mean, they would have to be, they probably end up coming on as an F band. And actually, we've actually had good luck hiring people that don't have a lot of experience, per se, you know, whether it be in the military or outside, but they have the aptitude. And some of the ones most recently we've hired have done extremely well, more with just the technical aptitude. So they might not come on as a G, but if they have the wherewithal and the uh, I guess the gumption, if you want to say, to apply themselves, they can get promoted relatively quickly. So, yeah, I mean, we have a guy that came on as an F, and he's now actually a temporary I band after only a couple of years. So, the opportunity is there. And, and I'd like to piggyback on that, Doug. I think, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the part that most people seem to have troubles with, and I myself had troubles with, uh, when I got out of the military and I followed the instructions on writing a resume that they provided at the transition course, I was told by the FAA I wasn't qualified for a single job. Then I called up the point of contact and a uh, half hour later, I was G-band certified for every uh, job we had. And that was with a four-year degree, two two-year degrees, an FCC license, a journeyman card, and a boiler license. But if you don't tell the full story, they don't know. There is no size limit to an, an FAA or a federal resume. People get hung up on this one page, but the FAA utilizes the resume to quantify your experience, which is why if you look at the uh, resume builder on USA Jobs, there's also some great OPM resume writing five-minute videos on YouTube, and they will tell you to include volunteer work, hobbies, because all of that can be quantified as experience. You know, someone that works on, on, on uh, generators at home on their RV, who regularly picks up a voltmeter and uses it, when they come to write a resume, they don't even think to put that on there. But that is practical uh, experience and aptitude that people have that they don't put on the resume because in other worlds, the resume is just a, hey, look at me, you really need to interview me. We as selecting officials don't even get to see the candidate if their resume doesn't quantify enough experience to make them qualified to be put on a list. So a lot of that, that aptitude, if there's other uh, life experiences to back it up, verifiable life experiences, by all means, put it on the end of your resume, get it on there. Um, I did one uh, hiring panel for someone that had about three years of time that they were away from the FAA, but they were able to identify every skill set that they used as a young new mother in managing a household. And when you break it down in business terms, it's a job I couldn't even handle. So make sure when you're writing your resumes that you look at the tools available and get all of your experience properly annotated. Then hand it to someone 
uh, husband, wife, spouse, friend that doesn't know what this stuff is and say, does this make sense? So that that you, you understand, because a, a lot of military folks will just put, yeah, I work on a WSC3 radio. HR techs may not know what that is. It happens to be a satellite UHF radio. Now, if you put military name, then put what it is in plain English so that everyone knows and what the frequency band is, because that's what's going to get you qualified, is if everyone understands what you're saying. So for everyone out there, that advice that Tom just gave you is so important. And I'm speaking from the HR side of this, is when we have a posting and we get hundreds of applications for these postings, it is imperative that the applicant put as much information as possible. And Tom pointed out some very important things. With USA Jobs, you can certainly update your res or upload your resume that you ha currently have, a one page, two page. But if it doesn't tell the whole story, when we're looking at hundreds of applications, there's a good possibility that you would, would not be considered. And it's not that you're not qualified, it's just that we weren't able to qualify you against the other applicants that were in there. So as Tom said, you, uh, OPM of the USA Jobs has a resume builder that I strongly encourage. You don't have to use it, by all means you don't, but they do have training as Tom pointed out on there. And it's just go through that training and it really addresses everything you need to know in that. So, so thank you for bringing it up, Tom, because I cannot stress how important that is. And, and Doug, there's one other thing. Uh, the uh, National Archives has got a federal resume writing guide that is very good. All of this stuff is available to the general public um, via uh, the internet. Um, and the number one disqualifier for applicants that we have sent in when we were doing VRA hires or off the street is when they forget to put the hours per week. And why that is so important is if you're, let's say a reservist and you're only working uh, weekends, like one weekend a month, that's very different than being a full time. And they're trying to quantify your experience. And in order to do that, they need hours per week. Um, if it's 40 or more, full time is sufficient for qualification. But if you're doing something for 20 hours a week and you got six years worth of it, that's three years worth of verifiable. And that meets the criteria for what they're looking for for the F band. So make sure you yeah. get that hours per week in there. What I recommend people do is use the USA Jobs format, but do it in Word because then you have a spell checker that works. The format prints better. It's easier to read when you're receiving it, but then you can upload that in one of your uh, uploadable uh, uh, sections on USA Jobs. Thank you for that. And th these are great questions and we're gonna keep answering these questions in the time that we have allotted. So if you think of something after, I just want to remind you going to the FAA's Tech Ops page and asking a question if we don't get to answer it during this session. So I just want to put that out as a reminder. We have one question that says, what is the average time between applying, being selected and start training at the academy? So we in the FAA, we have an 80 day hiring model. So from the time that it gets posted to the time someone goes on, uh, steps foot in the door, we strive for 80 days. Sometimes we can do it quicker. Sometimes we can't do it as quick. It really depends based on the background check, uh, security. A lot of times if you have, if there's anything in your background, not, and please don't misunderstand me that if you have something in your background, you can't apply. By all means, apply. If there's something in your background, if it's a financial issue, you work with our security office to get it resolved or get it cleared up to their satisfaction. So the 80 days is what we strive for. And again, sometimes it's sooner, sometimes it's, it's longer, but that, that's what we're striving for. Okay. Can you speak, please speak to how your discipline track is chosen. Doug, I'll take a stab and then see if somebody else wants to answer it. I mean, the way the jobs are done, they're broken out by communication, radar, environmental, you know, so they're split out. So if someone has a specialty that their, their skill set um, goes towards, I would recommend them do that. I mean, I and mean, you can apply for multiple ones too, because depending on what, if you were in the military, your career, you might fall under navigation and communication. 
So don't just limit yourself to one if there are multiple disciplines or things that um, your background would lend themselves to. So it's all a matter of what your background is. And if you come in as an F, which is the entry level, um, that might get determined for you depending on the openings at different places across the United States. Um, so the F band, you come in um, not with a specialty, since you didn't apply for a special job for the G band, the F band, it's gonna be more open to what the need is of the um, FAA, I guess if you wanna say it that way. Thank you for that. Will college students have a good chance at being hired? Uh, I will tell you that's an absolute yes. And, I, and as far as groups or organizations within the uh, FAA, Tech Ops is probably the premier place for young college students uh, fresh out of college. In fact, we in our office, we work at a service area in Fort Worth, Texas. And I always know when Tech Ops is hiring because I'm like, oh, it's bring your kids to work day. We have hundreds of young adults coming into the office at one time. So yes, this is a, a perfect opportunity for college students. Not that they're um, exclusive to college students because if you're uh, older than that or have been in the career for a while and this is your second career as Tom pointed out, there's room for you as well. But yes, there, there's a very good opportunity for college students. Hey Doug, just to point that out, we currently have a major modification where we're changing out all of the radios at O'Hare. And the installation team is two fresh out of college uh, mechanical engineers because they, they met the, the requirements to get hired and, and they're out there changing out and learning all the electronic side as they go. And they're doing a fantastic job. Great. And there's also, for those of you that are currently still in college, there's internship opportunities that we also offer. Can you end up specializing in multiple jobs such as nav aids and environmental? Oh, most definitely. If you're at a small airport um, or at a uh, what we would refer to as a GNAS, uh, you, you become a jack of all trades in some of those. It's, it's whoever you can get through school and who's available. Um, at O'Hare, it's a little bit more limited because we have a separate shop for each discipline. But at DuPage they, and uh, Midway, they get their hands into everything. And since it's a small team, they all have a tendency to go out and work on the bigger projects, no matter what system it is. Okay, great. And Doug, I'd like to piggyback on that real quick. Absolutely. So for a team like mine, I manage the international SSC. And for those that don't know what that is, it's the, we cover the Caribbean, the Turks and Caicos Islands, and to include Cuba. And so my team are well diverse. These guys, most of them are radar techs, but they have to do environmental, comm, navigation. They do it all when they're on the islands because they don't have a team to pick from. So when they get there, so they're well diverse. And, and something else that I want to make sure, because I don't think we covered it, is um, your full journeyman level, you're promoted to an H band. And H bands are minimum supervision. So typically we put the trust in your hands to be able to go and perform jobs on your own. So we're not going to be standing over your shoulder going, did you do your preventive maintenance? Did you get there on time? It's those type of things. Just wanted to put that out there. But yeah, you can end up working in, in multiple disciplines based on where you are assigned or the FAA need. Thank you, Steve. Will my comp TIA certifications be helpful in satisfying any of the tech qualifications? Doug, I know that used to be one of the things that we were looking for. I don't know necessarily. Um, it used to be a requirement, Sarah, but they dropped it. Yeah. It yeah. was a requirement for, for like the STARS uh, training and ERAM and some of those systems, but they dropped it. But I can tell you, it does help, even though they've limited. Uh, I can remember back in my day, we used to work on our own computers. We used to fix everything. You know, we'd update the RAM, we do everything to our own computers, but now we have an entire IT department. So that may be an area which you want to apply for. You know, the FAA does have that. So. Well, on top of that, uh, Unix is still a requirement for many other classes. So if you have an aptitude for, for anything in the computer world, uh, a lot of our stuff is automated now. And all of the stuff at O'Hare is connected by a fiber net that is all running through computers. So um, I'm sure it cannot hurt 
and it might be a tiebreaker. Thank you all for that. Appreciate that. So retired Air Force vet here and current DOD employee. Could I apply for multiple positions since I have experience in multiple equipment items? Absolutely. There's no limit to the amount of positions you can apply for. You can apply for every posting that we have in the FAA. Obviously, you're going to want to be qualified for them or you're not going to make it any further. But in this, in your question, that if you're qualified for them, by all means, there's no limit to how many positions you can apply for. Just to make sure you're applying for the ones that say general public or vet and not the ones that say current FAA employee. I am not in a position to move based on my spouse's career. What is the general geographical area that someone would work in the Northeast square miles wise? That person, I mean, in the Northeast, there's a lot of SSCs in real close proximity to each other. Um, so depending on where you got picked up or selected for, um, you might not have that far to drive. It's all a matter of where, which SSCs or which facilities out there have openings because there's artsies, there's towers, there's tracons, and then there's the SSCs that are fall under the GNAS. So any number of those you could work in and you'd only have like 20 square miles to drive in. It just depends on where you get hired. Yeah, that's, that's a, a tough one. And keep in mind, as when we introduce Jeff McCoy, he is responsible for 6,000 locations. So there's a lot of locations. Would any of these opportunities be a good fit for applicants with a four-year degree in aerospace engineering and some experience working with basic electrical equipment? Yes, absolutely. And not to say not to apply for a technician job, but the FAA also has engineers that they hire too. And there's engineers in all the service areas. But a good way to start is a lot of times is they come on as technicians or an ATSS, figure out how the equipment works, and then they transfer over to being an engineer and support. So there's different roles that you can do. I mean, but as an engineer, you are more than welcome to come work on the equipment in tech ops. Thank you. Can you please speak to the average amount of time on the road for a new ATSS hire for training and the job in general? That's gonna vary quite a bit based on where they get hired at, what discipline they're hired for, and what the availability of the academy has been. Because for the last two years, it's been very little road time. Um, and we've switched a fair amount of the training over to uh, virtual training or distance training, and then send them for a shorter amount of time to do the labs. But again, it will depend on what discipline they are. There's some disciplines that have a lot more schooling than others. Okay, thank you. Could you tell us what is the role of the geo inspector? I don't know what that is, Doug, so I would say no. Um, <laughs> Let me, uh, yeah, uh, maybe, in, well, I don't know. I don't want to uh, assume what, so if that person who wrote that, if they would like to uh, just clarify that in another message, we'd be happy to respond. So I just want to let everyone know that we have seven minutes left. So we're going to keep on answering questions, of course. And if, again, if we can't answer your question, what we'll do in the, I don't know where we'll put it, but can we put up the link to the Tech Ops webpage so they can ask a question? If and We will try to get to it. There's only a few left, so we might be able to do it. But if not, if we could put that up for the audience to see, that would be great. Uh, can you share the PowerPoint Q&A with Tech Ops managers? Very useful information. Yes, we will absolutely do that with our Tech Ops managers. Uh, is the FAA a nice place to work? I, I think we can all, I, I'm only speaking for myself. It, it is truly one of the, it's the best federal agency that I've worked at and I've worked at a few. And as far as work-life balance, the 
the diversity of the work that we do, the jobs, and our mission. We have one of the most important missions in the world, and it's to keep the flying public safe. And probably, I would say, if not all of you watching, most of you have been on an airplane before. And just, and we as, and I, me as a, a passenger on a plane, take for granted that getting on a plane and landing safely in my location that I'm going to, I just take it for granted. I don't think, I didn't never thought until I worked for the FAA, what all goes behind that and the work that's put in there. So I can speak for myself and I'm sure the other three will echo, but it, it's a phenomenal place to work. I mean, I, I can't think of a better one, to be honest. Would anyone else like to add to that? No, I think you summed it up very well, Doug. Like I said earlier, it's like there's a, somebody new here and they used to work in the government somewhere else. And they came to work here and they said they were so surprised at how many people had been here for 10, 20, 30 years with the FAA. So yeah, uh, that speaks volumes when you hear of a government agency and people have been with the government for so long at a specific agency. Okay. So what is the GS equivalent for your entry level position? So normally a GS equivalent is going to be a GS 10 or a GS 11, depending on what the entry level position is. So for us, an F band, which we show um, is one of the positions that we have, that's equivalent to a G, um, I'm sorry, a 10, and the G is equivalent to an 11. And if they're familiar with the term ladder position, since our goal is to get everyone to H, it, it would be a ladder, a, a 10, 10, 11, 12 ladder position, because you're not going to, if, if you're not making it as an F, that one year probation will have you, you usually don't stay, because the goal is to get everyone to H band. And then the fact that we hire all of our, our support roles uh, within Tech Ops, usually from the 2101 series, you've got promotion capability all the way up to Jeff McCoy's position over time if you have the skill, talent, and, and uh, abilities. Uh, so coming in as a 2101 F band, uh, the, the world is yours if you want to grab it. it it's because that's where we, we grow all of our positions from. Absolutely. And just to kind of piggyback on what Tom said, when we're talking about ladder positions, a lot of times we will do FGH and that's how we post a position. So you come in as an F, and depending on how well you do as an F, you can, based on your work performance and your manage, manager's uh, review of your, the evaluation, you can move to the next level without actually applying for a promotion. It just, it, it's a natural move. It's not an automatic, so I wanna make sure we're very clear about that, but it definitely, um, it helps a lot of people, especially when they're doing a very good job in what the level they're at, you can move up. So let me see if there are anything else. There was a question about training. Can one of you talk about just in general terms about the training process, please? Well, no matter what discipline you come on when you first get hired, you're doing training through Elms or Blackboard, you know, the, the generic type training that everybody has to do. And a lot of that's all local directed study type things. Um, depending on if you're on a specific type of equipment, then you actually sometimes have a prerequisite you have to do. So you're doing directed study again, or ELMS, which is our electronic learning system. Um, and then you go down to Oklahoma City. Sometimes you're down in Oklahoma City for a week. Sometimes it can be two months. It just depends on the type of equipment. And then of course, when you do an equipment school, you have to go through an OJT process upon your return, so on the job training. And then you get somebody else that'll provide a certification exam for you. So that way you can now become a certified technician to work on specific pieces of equipment. And every piece of equipment, if it's certifiable, has a different certification um, test at the end. But every piece of equipment the FAA has, you get trained on, you do OJT, you do certification. Well, we are right at our time. So I want to thank you all very much for your participation. Sarah, Steve, Tom, I could not thank you more. What a wonderful job you did explaining what we do at the FAA. 
And again, if you have any questions, please go to our website, look at the information that you, we have there and also ask questions on there. It's going to be by the job postings that we have on the left-hand side towards the bottom. Thank you and all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Doug.